How many of you have seen or know of the menorah? Uh So in Hebrew, it's pronounced menorah. We have a tendency to take Hebrew words into English and, I don't know, they don't sound as pleasant. I love saying menorah. And this is, I pulled this out of the library. So this is a image of a menorah. I want to talk to you about this image and what it means. Yahweh has a methodology of uh, bringing us information through various means. And he uses symbols and he uses patterns. The Bible is full of it, full of patterns, full of imagery. He comes to us by many titles, by many names, all in the effort to communicate to us who he is. One of his names or title is Ein Sof. Has anyone been familiar with that? Ein Sof. It means without definition. How do you define a God who is beyond definition? As soon as you give him a name, you've defined him because the name reflects his character and his attributes. And so one of his titles, one of his names is Ein Sof, with beyond definition. He has appeared to many by different names and different imagery. So, Ted, when you were doing your Bible study this morning, I was, it just brought back to my attention again how many terms he has gone by, how many ways he has introduced himself to us. And we have made some errors in thinking that he's just limited to one thing when he's so much more. And so one of those image, images is this menorah. I just want to point it out to you. Of course, you know that it was in the tabernacle. Moses Mishkan, it's called. Moshe uh, had that tabernacle, and he was, to, he was instructed to follow the pattern that was shown from him from the heavenly pattern. And so these scriptures, I'm going to hit you up with this. I want you to see something. Who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light? You see that word light? I always thought that word light meant light that we see here. It means much more than just sunlight. It means much more than just um, heavenly light. Well, it does mean heavenly light. And so the heavenly light, that's unapproachable. And I'm always, I've always been struck by the fact that he has these beings called seraphim. And they have six wings. That's how you know them. Six wings. And with two, it says they cover their faces. Two, they cover their feet. And with two, they fly. These beings have to cover themselves, even though they're created to be in the presence of Yahweh, they have to cover themselves from the brightness of his glory. That kind of light. But the light that I'm talking about, the light that Yeshua gives us, is beyond just sunlight. It's about revelation. That's what I'm talking about. The revelation light, the light that gives you information about who this creator is. And it says that he is the image of the invisible Yahweh, the invisible Elohim, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether on whether thrones or dominions or rule. You know this. They've been created through him and by him. I love that term through him and for him and by him. He is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. I had to give this whole scripture because if you miss this, then you're going to miss the symbology. It says all things hold together through him. And it's referring to this menorah. I'm giving it away already. This center um, branch is called, the branch is called the Yarek. It's called the Shamash, the servant candle. This branch is what holds the other branches. So when he's talking about he is before all things and in him all things hold together, in Yeshua all things hold together. He is that Yarek. He's the branch. He's the, he's the vine and we are the branches. You've heard all these scriptures. It's, it's going to come to life in this menorah. And it says it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. The fullness means spirit. And the spirit is represented by oil, olive oil. And so to get the oil from these very precious olive trees, these olive, you had to beat them. 
And so again, it's pointing back another type, a shadow of the Messiah. The Hebrew word is mikshah, and it, it talks about the, it's difficult. It's difficult to get oil from a, from an olive by beating it. And thus, the Messiah's beating was very difficult. He received a beating by his stripes. We have been healed, but he took a beating. Yahweh is the living word. He is the tree of life. Here's that word, tree of life. I'm going to go fast, so you can talk to me afterwards. This is also referred to as the tree of life, this symbol, another symbol. Tree of life. Messiah is the tree of life. The menorah represents the tree of life. And also, I want to just give you the understanding of all these parts of the, of the menorah. It's made from a talent. I'm not a talent. It's made from a solid piece of gold. This is one of those things. It was supposed to be a beaten one piece of gold. How the artisan made this menorah, nobody knows. It's still a mystery. Because how do you beat one piece of gold into that? And it's hollow, by the way, because you have to pour oil in it. How do you do that? And, and by the way, gold is very pliable. How do the arms stay up? Nobody knows these secrets. Nobody knows to this day. There have been many different speculations, but nobody knows. Each morning, a priest prepares and rekindles the wicks. The central wick is, is uh, required to burn perpetually. And those wicks were made from the priest's robes. The, the, the clothing that the priest wore, when they became old, they used those, those, that linen cloth to make those wicks. So every day it had to be attended to. The main thing is that it could not go out. It had to stay lit continually. On one branch are to be three cups shaped like almond blossoms, each with a ring of outer leaves and petals. Likewise, on the opposite branch, three cups shaped like almond blossoms, each with a ring of outer leaves and petals. And similarly, for all six branches extending to the menorah. Now, what did I just say? The shape and design of this menorah had almond blossoms, petals, cups. Can you think of somewhere in scripture where an almond branch tree was mentioned referring to the Messiah? What? Aaron's rod rod that what? Yeah, Aaron's rod that he carried as a sign of his authority um, when his authority was challenged, his rod actually came back to life. It was a stick. It was a branch and it was cut off and it was brought back to life and actually blossomed almonds. And so I'm going to give it away again. The almond tree is actually what's being referenced when it comes to the tree of life. The almond tree. So there, what you said, Seth, is correct. There's another reason why it's, um, why it's being used in, in this way. And I'll, I'm getting ahead of myself again. I'll keep going. Yeshua's title, one of his titles, one of the symbols of Messiah is he's the branch. That's found in those, you know, four or five scriptures. Jeremiah 23.3, Zechariah 3.8. He's called the branch. He is the central trunk, the yarek of the great menorah, strengthening the side branches who follow him. So take a look at that. You know, when I grew up, I was always told that the image or symbol that best represented the Messiah is the cross. I have come to the knowledge now that this is the image that represents the Messiah most. I used to think I knew a lot of information. I studied, and I still do study a lot. And uh, what I have learned, and probably you've probably learned the same thing, that the more you learn about the Messiah about Yahweh, the more you learn and take in knowledge and light from him and, 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 and discernment and wisdom, the more you realize you don't know anything. And as much information I can, that I can spew out today about this subject, I can still tell you I don't know anything. Still don't know anything. He is inexhaustible. You cannot exhaust his wisdom. It's humbling to learn from Messiah. Because just when you think you've got it all figured out, he says, oh, and by the way, here's another room. Did you examine this room? Opens the door, there's a vast, a vast room of knowledge and wisdom waiting. 
It's like driving across the country. You ever drive from West Coast to the East Coast? But, you know, you get to this hill, you think, I'm almost there. And you come over the top of the hill, it's like, there's another hill. It's way down there. Okay, I got another hill. I'm there. Nope, there's still more. That's what it's like for me, understanding and, and studying Yahweh's wisdom and his knowledge. Just when you think you've, you've got it, you haven't gotten it. You haven't even got a taste. This is what I was talking about. Yeshua said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Again, reference to the menorah. You've seen this before. He is before all things, and in him all things, again, referring to this center branch, he's holding all things together. And this is, this is one of the references about being a branch. And then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will appear, will bear fruit. And the spirit, the ruach of Yahweh, will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. This is the best picture of who the Messiah is. This is a descriptor that you need to really embrace and understand. And again, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was filled with the whole spirit of Yahweh. So when we're talking about these seven spirits, they offset each other. So when I'm saying that the spirit of wisdom is here, and then on the other side would be the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of strength, the spirit of knowledge, and the fear of Yahweh. And then, of course, that's the spirit, the fear, and the spirit of the Lord in the middle. That's Yahweh. Are you seeing this imagery come to life now? Are you, are you getting a picture? Because I'm about to explode it now. I wanted, I wanted to really get it going here. So let's see in scriptures now. I'm going to give you a bunch of scriptures where this is being talked about. Don't think about this being sunlight. It's more than just sunlight. Having turned, I saw seven golden. I interjected the word menorahs because it says lampstands. The menorah is a lampstand. Our English translation doesn't do it justice. It should have said menorahs. Having turned, this is John, Yachanan in Revelation. He said, having turned, I saw seven golden menorahs. And in the middle of the menorahs, one like a son of man, clothed in a robe reaching to his feet and girded across his chest, his breast with a golden girdle. This is the imagery of a priest, a high priest. He's dressed as a high priest. He's standing in the middle of seven menorahs. I've previously spoken to you about um, when Moshe was out in the wilderness and he saw this sight, this burning bush. And it was on fire, but it was not being consumed, the all-consuming fire. And he went to that bush. And it says, when God saw that he had turned aside, he called to Moshe from the midst of the bush. The uh, Hebrew scholars, the sages would say, there is no redundant word in Hebrew. So when it says that the Lord spoke to him, called him from the midst of the burning bush, he says, Moshe, Moshe. It wasn't that Moshe was hard of hearing. The Hebrew understanding is that Two parts of the Godhead called out to him from the midst of the bush. And from the midst of the bush, that bush is another symbol. A burning bush is very much likened unto a menorah. So what Moshe was seeing was a symbol of what was in heaven. He was witnessing Yahweh in his strength speaking to him from the midst of these, of these menorah, menorahs, just like this imagery here that's in heaven. And his head and hair were white like wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. Look at the imagery. You think about his head and hair were like white, like the light shining from a lamp, and then his eyes were actually flames, and his feet were like brownish brass when it's being heated. It's imagery of a menorah. He is the menorah of God. He's the light of the world. And I see in Scripture how many times, in many ways, he's trying to communicate to us this truth. But can you see it? Because much, much of this is being generated not as, again, physical light, but the light of revelation. So I can talk to you until I'm just blue in the face, but unless the Ruach shows you, you won't see it. And that's that revelation. That's that inner knowledge that only he, only he can give. 
and says, In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in his strength. Here's that, again, that bright shining. Think of that light. Unapproachable light. But it's more than just light. Light is the word we use to describe his brightness, his glory. And he says, Do not be afraid. I am the first and last. And the living one, and I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever. You can come up with your own conclusions, who this person is that's in heaven, that's looking like this and speaking like this, saying that he's the first and the last. He's basically saying, I am the Aleph and the Tav, the first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And he has the keys of death and and of Hades. All right, now I'm going to explode this. Avraham was commanded by Yahweh to take his son and sacrifice him. And it says, and Abraham lifted his eyes and looked and saw behind him. I used to think, I used to think a lot of things, but I used to think that when I read that, and he saw behind him a ram caught in a bush by its horns, that it meant only one thing. And that's not true at all. There's this word in Hebrew that denotes the fact that when you look behind you in Hebrew, you're also looking forward. So what, what happened with Avraham is that by looking backwards and seeing the ram at the same time, and let's just say dimensionally, he saw forward in the future when the ram or the lamb of God would be sacrificed. He saw something behind him, but in so looking behind him, he saw into the future. Moshe did this. Moshe, when he was speaking to the children of Israel before going to the promised land, it says that he was speaking to those there, but also those who were not there. He was talking to the children of Israel who were there, and he was talking into the future about those who would come after. Same thing. He saw behind him in this interdimensional idea of, I saw this ram caught with his horns in a thicket, a thicket being a crown of thorns. So, Arit Hayamim has a hidden meaning. It comes from the word Achar. Achar means both behind us and in a distant future. When Avraham looked behind him, he he saw a ram with his horns caught in the thicket. He simultaneously saw Yahweh's lamb with his head caught in the thicket. This is the beauty of Hebrew. That's why I believe Yahweh wrote his scriptures in Hebrew. There's so many more There's so much more uh, expressiveness in this language than in just English. And so Avraham had this vision of not only seeing this ram, but he saw what Yahweh was going to do in the future. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of the streets. And on either side of the river was a tree of life bearing 12 kinds of fruit. This is the vision of the coming kingdom. And in the kingdom, there's this tree of life. Just like in the garden, there was a tree of life. I want to show you something that might take too long to unpack today. So I'll just start it, and then maybe I'll do a part two or three. But this tree of life, it was bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, for us. There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him, and they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. I'm giving this as a preference, because it says, And there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God, Elohim, will illumine them. And illumine them. He will fill us full of insight and, and knowledge and wisdom. He will do it. It's not just light of the sun. It's the revelation of who he is that will fill us, that will illuminate us, that will enlighten us. That makes sense? In the future kingdom, we will have the menorah, the menorah in our midst that will shed light. And it says in Isaiah 2, verses 2 through 4, Micah 4, 2, that 
all the nations will stream to his holy mountain. And that he will teach us his Torah. And that we will have the master himself teaching us his ways, his paths. And this is the, the other part of that. We won't, we won't need sun. We won't need a reading light. Because the Messiah, I hope I won't need any more readers either. Because the Messiah will illuminate us. He will help us understand. It kind of reminds me of when Yeshua said to Shimon Kippa, he said, who do you say I am? Who does man say I am? And then the disciples answered, you know, well, some say you're a liar. Some say that you're, um, you, you know, Elijah, Moses, all these different answers, the prophets. And he said, but who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the son of the living God. You are the Mashiach. And the, the answer that the Messiah gave him was very important. He says, Flesh and blood did not, here's the word, reveal. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. That's that illumination. There's that insight, that knowledge, that insight that was given to him, that light is what gave him that knowledge. And so the Messiah is the giving, is the giver of light. So now here's what I want to do. I'm going to give you a bunch of scriptures. I want you to read them out loud. Is that okay? Again, it says, no man has revealed this to you. It was my Father in heaven. This is what I just was talking about, Isaiah uh, 2, verses 2 through 4. He will teach us about his ways, and we will walk in his paths. We will understand the insights that have been hidden for centuries. So the menorah is the symbolic picture. Now, here's what I want you to do. Together, we're going to read these scriptures. And I hope, it's like four pages of these. Four slides of these. But I hope that during the process, something will click. Something will switch on. Some light will enter you as you put these together. Let's read it together. Wrapped in light as with a robe, you spread out the heavens like a curtain. That's in Psalm 104.2. Wrapped in light as with a robe. The Messiah is wrapped in light. I, I shouldn't stop. I'm going to keep reading. For it is yod heh who once said, let light shine out of the darkness. Who has made his light shine in our hearts? The light of the knowledge of Yahweh's glory, shining in the face of the Messiah Yeshua. When his lamp shone over my head and I walked through the dark by its light. That's Job saying that. His brightness is like the sun. Rays come forth from his hands. That is where his power is concealed. For you, Adonai, light my lamp. Adonai, my God, lights up my darkness. No more will the sun be your light by day, nor will moonlight shine on you. Instead, Adonai will be your light forever, and your God, your glory. Okay, I got to stop here. When the high priest would give the ironic blessing, he would make the sign of the sheen with his fingers. I can't do it because my fingers are just really messed up. And it is said that the Shekinah glory would appear, the glory, the light between his hands, coming right from the throne of God when he would do this. Yair, Yahweh panah belecha bichunecha. May Yahweh make his face, see this, shine on you and show you his favor. Last one. Or the last two. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Yeshua spoke to them again. Read with me. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light which gives life. He has said, it is not enough that you are merely my servants to raise up the tribes of Yaakov, and restore the offspring of Israel. I will also make you a light to the nations, so my salvation can spread to the ends of the earth. A little pattern going on here. In these words, blessed be the name of God from eternity past to eternity future, for wisdom and power are his alone. He brings the changes of seasons and times. He installs and deposes kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those with discernment. 
it, he reveals deep and secret things. He knows what lies in the darkness and the light dwells with him. He's a giver of light, but that light is talking about he gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those with discernment. That's the light we're talking about here. So this word, Damascus, is, is Damascus. He was on the road. You can stop reading now. He was on the road nearing Damascus when suddenly a light from heaven flashed all around him. This is Shaul, Rob Shaul. We call him Paul. Remember, he was persecuting believers. And on the road, a bright light shined around him from heaven. You seeing the pattern now? Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying, Shaul, Shaul, why do you keep persecuting me? It says, who? Who's, who's asking him the question? The menorah. Sir, who are you, he asked. I am Yeshua, and you are persecuting me. But get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you are to do. So again, you see this light. Think of it again. He is the light of the world. He is the light shown down from heaven. He is the menorah. He's the one who shined his glory. And I'm not done. Remember this story? Six days later, Yeshua took Kepha, Peter, Yaakov, and his brother Yachanan and led them up a high mountain privately. As they watched, he began to change form. His face shone and his clothing became as he is the menorah. Remember this guy. For I have seen with my own eyes your salvation. And salvation in Hebrew is Yeshua. In which you prepared in the presence of all people a light that will bring revelation to the goyim and glory to your people Israel. If you know me by now, you know I hate the word Gentile. That's not a, a Hebrew word. That's a word that's been inserted into our Bibles. The word is goyim, which means the nations. A light that will bring revelation to us, the nations. Are you ready for this? So, this is ancient writing, Hebrew writing. It is believed that in the garden, Adam and Eve were clothed with garments of light. Yeah, I'm going to get to I'm going to explode this out. That they weren't, quote, quote, naked in the garden. Yahweh had clothed them with that same type of light. And when they sinned, the cause being the sin, the, the sin diminished that light. So their bodies at one point, this is the Hebrew understanding, they gave off this glow, like the angels. The angels give off this glow. You hear many reports in the scriptures about the, how they were shiny, they were bright, and, and, and the, 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 the menorah was bright. Well, even Adam and Eve had these garments. They were clothed with garments of light. And as a result of the sin, he clothed us with skins. Another way to understand that is he gave us these coverings. You see in this scripture, when Moshe came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, he didn't realize that the skin of his face was sending out rays of light as a result of his talking with Adonai. Who was he talking to in the mountain? Who? <laughs> when Aharon and the people of Israel saw Moshe, the skin of his face was shining. This is in Psalm. You pointed this out, Steve, about the noon. It says, your word is a lamp for my foot, for my feet, and light on my path. The word there being used should be capitalized. He is the living Torah. And your word, O Yahweh, is a lamp, a menorah, menorah, for my foot, if we walk in the pathways of Yahweh, and a light on my path. Are you seeing this? So, this symbol here is not just a candle a lampstand, it represents the Messiah. It represents his purpose. He is the light of the world. If you're walking in darkness and you want to know about Yahweh, this is how you learn. Knowing 
the light. Elohim is the father of lights. I'll read this to you and I'll end. Ben, you can start making your way up here. The Greek word phos for James 1, 17. Phos refers to a brightly burning lamp. He, the father, is also the father of burning lamps, menorahs. And inseparable from light. He can be decked himself in any color, but he chooses light for his mantle and garment. That's taken from Psalm 104, 2. In Psalm 11, 2, in Revelation 4, 5, light represents the almighty seven spirits. Of all the furnishings of the tabernacle or temple, only the menorah's seven flaming torches could express this. In Revelation's heavenly throne room, seven lamps of fire burn before the throne to depict Yahweh's light, greatness, splendor, majesty, holiness, and sovereignty. The prophet Zechariah considered the menorah to be equipped with divine eyes. The seven menorah branches were the eyes of El Elyon, God Most High. He's, his eyes searched the earth, probed men's souls, and illuminated men's heart with the light of the knowledge of his glory. I have here a Sidur. And Psalm 67 is a psalm of the menorah. So he's the father of lights. The Lord wraps himself in the light as with a garment. For the Lord who commands the light to shine out of the darkness has shone in our hearts. His light I walk through. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light to my path. This is, I'm going to end with this. This is an experiment done by Japanese scientists in which they use a very strong photon emission um, microscope. And they notice that human beings give off light. To imagine what Adam, uh, Adam and Chava bodies might have looked like. They might have been clothed in an aurora of light. This is Psalm 67. This is what I wanted to get to. And in some synagogues, some tombs, um, and in the Siddur, prayer book, it's a prayer book, you will see Psalm 67 written like this. And this is what I didn't get to today. So I just, I'll say I'm going to save this for the next time. Because this is also a pattern. This menorah is a pattern. It's a pattern of what Yahweh is doing. So, seven spirits. Here is the pattern, the divine pattern. We already talked about this in Isaiah 11. The Lord, wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, fear. This pattern runs throughout the Bible. I'll probably show you 15 different places. In Isaiah, that's what it looks like. In the menorah of history, I could spend the rest of the night telling you about this one. I'll let you see it, though. In the feast days, the feast days are also a pattern of divine um, menorah description. I'll end with this one. Whoa. So these are the first seven. And notice again, seven words, seven bowls, seven seals, seven stars, seven angels, seven churches. This is the divine pattern. Bereshit bara Elohim et alaf tav hashamayim veet haaretz. You notice that. The fourth word in the beginning. This is from the first seven words in the beginning of uh, our Bibles. You notice that the fourth word is the Aleph Tav. The Aleph Tav is the first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet, which indicate Yahweh. Bereshipara Elohim et. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The middle branch in this Divine design is the Aleph Tav, is the menorah, well, is the Messiah. We'll talk more about this design at part two. How's that?